Hi class, welcome to Unit I, the test of independence. This in a sense is our first real unit in Business 307. In Unit R, we were looking at reviewing Biz 306. And so we looked at hypothesis testing and confidence interval. And then in Unit D, we jumped away from the numbers and we looked at data collection, sampling techniques, questionnaire design, so the non-mathematical or non-analytical part of stats. And then we looked at unit V, which was kind of a bridger topic. And so in that one, we were still dealing with univariate analysis, so just dealing with one variable. But we were focusing in on variance. And so we did hypothesis tests and confidence intervals for the population variance or standard deviation. But variance is a really important concept in BIS 307. So what we're moving into from now on, all the units from this point forward, is bivariate or multivariate analysis. So bivariate meaning two, two variables and how they interact or vary with each other. So it, we're actually going to be measuring variance between the two. And when we get into multiple regression, it could be actually multiple variables that we are looking at. To help you understand this a little bit better, I'm going to take us back here to page, let's see, it's somewhere around here, and there we go. So this is in unit D, where we talked about on page D18, data processing, and data scale types. And so we looked at nominal variables, ordinal variables, and interval variables. This actually goes way back to Business 306. But this is really key in us going forward in our particular course. So let's just take a look at the definition of those, and then we'll go back to where we were. With nominal variables, <clears throat> we're talking about categorical data. So the numbers which are assigned to them, if they are, don't really have any meaning, right? And so typically what we do is we assign labels. So gender, male or female or other, or um, what city were you born in? So Calgary, Edmonton, Red Deer, etc. That kind of thing. If we assign a numbers, it, it doesn't mean a whole lot. When we get into looking at what we call dummy variables at the end of unit M in multiple regression, we'll see how we can use um, these categorical or nominal variables there in a regression. Ordinal variables are when we're dealing with ranked data or ratings. And so ranked data would be, oh, choose your top three out of this list here, where one is your most preferred, second is your second most preferred, and three is your third most prefer rating would be on a five point scale how would you rate the cleanliness of the the bathrooms and so that is uh, ordinal data and it is from a statistical point of view you can do more stuff with it so you can calculate medians and, and things like that. Um, you can't calculate means, really, because you don't know the distances between the numbers. What's the difference between a 5 and a 6, and a 6 and a 7, and so on. All we know is one is higher than the other. Um, but it's better than nominal. All you can really do in nominal is, is come up with percentages. What percentage are male and what percentage are female? The strongest type of data are the interval scale variables. And so that is your, your typical um, type of data, such as height and weight and IQs and the number of times that you go to the library in a week and so on. So most of the variables that we deal with are interval in nature. Ratio data is a special category of that where we have... Um, Zero is the starting point. So if you take a look at age, a person starts their age at zero. And so you can say that a person who is 20 is twice as old as somebody who is 10. You can't say that about all interval scale variables, 
such as a, a uh, Celsius thermometer scale or temperature scale. You can't say that when it's 30 degrees outside that it's twice as hot as it is when it is 15 degrees out. Most of the interval data are ratio in nature. So when we talk about interval scale, we're usually talking ratio, but the same things apply. Why that is important is that there's different kinds of statistical things that we can do which each, with each type of data. So I'm going to jump back over to where we were here and take a look actually at, with the test of independence, the very first topic here is just a little paragraph that is talking about parametric and non-parametric tests. So most of the statistical tests discussed have certain properties of the parent population which must hold. So remember in the stuff that we were looking at in unit R and uh, actually really applies in unit V, although we didn't really stress it, was that the uh, you can calculate means and standard deviations for your distributions and there are certain assumptions about the parent population which must hold or conditions. So hence our discussions about the central limit theorem. And if n is at least 30, then you don't have to worry about that. But if n is less than 30, then the whole thing about that the parent population has to be normally distributed. So when we talk about parametric tests, we are in this course talking about then interval scale variables and the conditions, uh, almost always normality, but when we get into ANOVA, there'll be a, a further condition there of uh, homogeneity of variances, which we'll see. And uh, those conditions must hold in order for us to go forward. Otherwise, we have to use a non-parametric test. Now, a test of independence is what we call a non-parametric test. So, when we're talking about, say, looking at the relationship between a gender and um, what program that you're in at the college, those are both categorical, categorical variables, so nominal variables, and they aren't dependent on conditions about the population, right? It's not, you don't say that gender is normally distributed, Right? You don't say that about the, the um, programs either. So I, I'm just going to actually back up here and say what we're going to be looking at in this particular course is how two variables interact. And so if it's nominal versus nominal, that's actually where we're going to be using a test of independence. And we'll see that in the examples below. If it's nominal versus interval in nature, and by the way, that also includes as a subcategory here, ordinal, it's, uh, we're dealing with something called analysis of variance. So it's ANOVA, which is analysis of variance. And there is a variance, there's a special um, type of test here where it's nominal versus ordinal, it'll be a, I'm just going to put down that it's a KW test here, um, and a Friedman's test. And all of these are going to be talked about here then in the next unit, which is actually quite a big unit. It's unit A. Right now, we're taking a look at test of independence, which is unit I. And then finally, we get into interval versus interval, or it could be interval versus ordinal, and there we're talking about regression. Uh, I think I've got two S's there. And uh, also there'll be a special one here called uh, a Spearman's correlation when you're talking about ordinal. And we're going to see those discussed in unit C. And then regression is really C, S, and M. They're actually all kind of together here. They all run into the whole thing about regression. So those are the units that we're looking at here. And that actually will, for the most part, take us to the end of the course. There is a unit T in here, and we'll talk about that um, in here. It'll actually fit into this category in here, there. So that's the...
one of the next units that we look at. So let's take a look at now the test of independence. And typically you're dealing with um, nominal versus nominal here. By the way, the test of independence and the ANOVA tests, ANOVA, Kruska, Wallace, and and Friedman's and so on uh, are the ones that you'll typically be using in your analysis for your project. Uh, you may get into some regression, probably not multiple regression, but it's um, the, the, the first few here are going to be really the ones that you're going to be using the most of. So let's continue on here then and take a look at the test of independence. And the test of independence typically deals with determining whether there is a relationship that's really key with all of the tests that we're looking at here from this point forward. It exists between two variables. Usually these two variables are nominal in nature, although we one or both can be ordinal or interval scale variables. It's just that there are better tests to use for those ones that we'll see later in the course. So let me give you a class example here. Uh, a researcher wishes to determine if there is a relationship. So again, always are we seeing is there a relationship here, a dependency between the gender of a child and the time of day that she or he is born. So you'll notice that gender here is nominal in nature. The, the time of birth here is also not nominal in terms of the categories that we have. You could look at that as ordinal in nature, but you have to think of one being higher than the other. And uh, in this particular case, there it's kind of circular here, right? You've got 7 to 3 and then 3 to 11, so we're getting later in the day. and then But then we circle around back to from 11 to back to 7 o'clock here. So these are really just three categories of nominal variables, of uh, a nominal variable. So nominal versus nominal, that is a test of independence. And the thing that we use to analyze that then is a contingency table, right? So this is called a cross-tab table. It's called a contingency table. In Excel, we tend to use then a pivot table to create this thing. So all three of those are really equivalent terms that we'll be using. And you've seen these before. You saw this before back in your first stats course in Unit P if you took Business 306 from me. So does the gender of a child determine the time of birth? Now, a really important thing to note here is that we're really not asking whether one determines the other. We're asking if there's a relationship between them. And so you, you uh, determination here then implies causality, that one causes the other. And that's a really difficult thing to, to prove when you're dealing with socioeconomic kind of problems, which we are in a business class. If we were talking about controlling all the variables and dealing with Petri dishes in, in a in a biology lab and something like this, then you may be able to look at causation here, but it's it's really difficult when you're dealing with socioeconomic variables where there's all sorts of other factors that come into play here. So uh, although we tend to use that, that word a little loosely here, does the gender of the child determine the time of birth? Really we're saying is that is there a statistical relationship between the two? So let's walk through what we've got here. So the above table here then shows the observed frequencies or the actual absolute frequencies. So the counts and the symbols that we're going to use for those are those are the FIJs. Now in in some textbooks they use O instead. So the OIJs or sometimes just the O's. So they drop the the subscripts. The O for observed. And so we're just using F for the frequencies. The IJ, don't get hung up about the subscripts there. All we're simply saying is that when you, when you put it into a, a table like this, then you've got I and J as representing the indices of the, of the rows and the columns there. So uh, don't get hung up on that. In fact, you don't even have to use the IJs if you don't want to. So it's just math notation.
That's all it is. Okay, so these guys up here then are the FIJs. They are the actual or observed values. And so this one right here, I guess, would be your F11 or your F male, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Okay. Now, what we want to do is we want to come up with a table of EIJs where E stands for expected. Those are the frequencies that we would expect to observe um, if the two variables were totally unrelated to each other. That is, if they're independent with each other. And this really goes back to our first stats course where we noted this relationship here. The probability of A and B, or sometimes we write that like this, so the joint probability of A and B, like that, if they're independent, is equal to the product of the two marginal probabilities. So that's how, how that works there. Okay. So uh, let, let me show you what I've done in terms of, of that. If you take a look at these original numbers here, um, if, if you divided each of these by the total, oh, sorry, that's 60. So 30 divided by 60, 30 divided by 60, of course, 60 divided by 60. And then you could do the same for each of these, right? Then what you see is th this is a 30-30 split, so that's going to be 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And then 25 out of 60 is, is um, what is that? Well, this one here, that's 0 0.25. This is a third. And this is, I think it's about 42%, if I remember. Yeah, that's what we've got down here. So there are those probabilities there then. Uh, the split that we had based on the observed. And uh, so here's your 0.25, your 0.33, and there's your 0.42. Now, <clears throat> if we, to figure out this particular guy here, what we would do is we would take the product of the two marginal probabilities that that intersect that cell. So uh, in this particular case, you would take um, 0.33 and then half that, right? Multiply it by 0.5 and you would get 0.167. And so that is the expected uh, probability that we would have if the two events were independent. And, and then what we do is we just multiply them back to 60 so that we're back in the same um, sum of the FIJs, which was 60. So these 30s and these 20, 15, and 25s, they were the original totals up here, right? For the rows and for the columns and the grand total. Uh, but these guys here are the actual observed FIJs and these are the ones that we would expect to see if they're independent from each other. And then the question is, are these guys right here, which are the expected ones, significantly different from these guys up here, which are the observed? So these are the FIJs, and then these are the, the EIJs. And you actually have to look at it on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. So is the, is the 15 here then significantly different from the 10? And we, we actually look at all of them together. We come up with a collective measure. It follows a chi-square distribution. Um, so let's take a look on page I4 here. It says, but of course, the problem uh, with inferential s statistics is how close is close? For instance, if each of the observed frequencies differs from the correspondent frequencies by, just say, one, then we would probably say that there is not enough evidence to conclude that there is a relationship between the two variables. The slight differences between the observed and the expected frequency is likely only caused by sampling error. Remember what sampling error is, even if you've got the best design possible for collecting data, you're still going to find that your particular sample will probably differ from the population 
distribution by by some amount and hopefully it's very little but sometimes it can be much larger and uh, that that just happens when you are taking a sample here so uh, let me give you an example on on this one here and suppose we've got we're looking at if there's a relationship between two variables now the first one here we're looking at is the gender of the person and whether they've worn glasses or contacts in the past year. And, and maybe what we should say there is that they should be wearing glasses or contacts because some people just choose not to, although their, their eyes really dictate that they should be wearing glasses. Um, what we know here is that these two variables are independent of each other. Okay, so I, I'm just giving that to you as a given. I've made the numbers really simple down here, so I've just done 50-50 splits all along. So suppose we had 50 males and 50 females in a group of 100, and uh, let's say the, the, the split here was 50-50 in terms of, yeah, they should be wearing glasses, or no, they shouldn't be wearing glasses, okay? So what we've got here then is... Um, these are the actual numbers here. Now, what are the expected numbers that we would see in each cell here? And uh, just take a, a moment here, and I think uh, what you'd find is that, I mean, we have 50-50 splits for the rows. We have 50-50 splits for the columns. So it doesn't take long to figure out that what we would expect to see if they're independent of each other would be 25s all the way around, right? So... Those are the EIJs, and then, so that's the EIJs here. And then these guys here are the FIJs, right? The ones in black, and uh, that I've pointed to in blue. So in this particular example, you can see that, well, yeah, 26 is not the same as 25, but the difference is probably just because of sampling error. And, uh, you know, you're not likely to exactly end up with all 25s all the way around and so on. Uh, hopefully you do, but it's likely that you'll be off by one or two. That's just the way it works. But let's take a look at this one here. And suppose we're talking about, have you worn nylon leggings in the past year? And so this is something that uh, I'm just making up some numbers here and so on. But this is something that, that tends to be a little more... Um, related to a person's gender here. So these might be the actuals that you end up with. So you end up with, you know, maybe 48 of the 50 females say, uh, yeah, they've worn um, nylons in the last year and two have not. And maybe with guys, it's the, it's the opposite. And so what we would tend to say here is that compare that to, again, what we would expect to see, which are, I'm using the same totals here. So they're 25s all the way around. And by the way, that's just because these are both 50s and these are both 50s, right? That doesn't work for every 2x2 two two matrix if those numbers are different. Um, but here what you would see is that 2 is much smaller than what we would expect to see if these two variables were independent. So 2 is much smaller than 25. 48 is much larger. So this is what we end up with is uh, I always like to go and circle the cells where the FIJ is much higher than the EIJ. And there you'll see that um, the relationship is that there is a dependency. They are related. And we can say as a conclusion here that males typically do not wear nylon leggings and, and females um, do there's a greater propensity for women to wear nylon leggings versus males. So that's how we would tend to, to do that kind of thing. Let's take a look at the tests of the hypothesis here. So the chi-square test of independence can be formed using either a classical or p-value approach. And what you're going to see here is it's the usual five steps. So if you've done a hypothesis test before, it's the same five steps that you go through. The hypotheses are always of the form like so. And we actually write them out in words. 
So the two variables are independent. That is, there's no relationship versus the two variables are not independent. Two things I want you to note here. With a test of independence, we actually write it that way, except that we would not put in just generally the two variables. We would actually name them. So in our particular case, then, we would say that the gender of the person is and um, whether they wear glasses or should wear glasses are independent versus the gender and whether they should wear glasses are not independent. That is, that they are dependent would be another way of saying that. The other thing to, to note here then is in this particular test and pretty well every other test that we do right through to the end of the course here, the null hypothesis is always no relationship. And that's written in different ways, but um, that's what, what it is. Yeah, there's no relationship between these two variables versus there is. And so in a test of independence, it's really easy to write that. It's you name the variables and say that they're independent versus they're not independent. <clears throat> the test statistic is always this one right here. Now, I, I want to come back here just for a second and say a chi-square test, because you'll notice down here that this is a chi-square distribution, right? Chi-square star. And um, in unit V, we always used a chi-square test when we were testing variances. It was equal to some number versus the alternative that it's not equal to some number. And of course, it could be a one-sided test too. In our particular case, what I want to say is that this is actually equivalent to saying that the variance is equal to zero. That is, the variance between the two variables is zero versus it's not. How does that work down here? Well, if you take a look at, remember this guy here, back from your first stats course? So here's a variance. And what is a variance? Well, a variance is the average of squared deviations. In this case, deviations from the mean. Do we have the equivalent down here? Yes. We've got a form of an average. By the way, don't let the double summation bother you. Again, we're just... That's just to say that we've got both rows and columns. I don't even care if you put in two summations there. I don't even care if you put in the subscripts um, I and J there. But the important thing here is that this is a type of average. We're averaging over the expected values. Um, sorry, I should have used blue to correspond to what I've got above there. Of squared deviations. And the deviations that we're looking at are between the actual and the expected, the ones that we would expect to see if they're independent. Now, if they're really close to each other, um, if they're identical to each other, of course, then you would end up with a variance of zero. And that would mean that they are independent of each other because your actuals equal the ones we would expect to see if they're independent. However, if they are um, much different from each other, then what we'll end up with is a big variation. Notice, of course, that a chi-square is always testing variances, which is always positive. So the, the nice thing about this is that this is always an upper tail test because um, the lowest it can be is zero, which happens when the two variables are independent of each other. And then if there's a big difference between the FIJs and the EIJs, then you would have a, a, a big chi-square star value, which would be in the right-hand tail. So it's always an upper tail chi-square test, which really makes things a lot easier. The degrees of freedom are a little different from what we've seen before. Before, we were always talking about just one variable, and so it was univariate, and it was n minus 1. Um, here, it's n minus 1 times m minus 1, 
And the n actually is defined a little differently. It's the number of rows of the contingency table. And m is the number of columns of the contingency table. So the number of rows minus 1 times the number of columns minus 1. If you would prefer, I mean, people sometimes put this down here then as, um, you, you, you could say the number of rows minus 1 and the number of columns minus 1. That would be uh, one way of, of doing that. That would be okay to do that. For columns, I mean, uh, well, we'll get into this a little bit later, is for categories, we'll often use K, and we'll see that later in unit A. But um, if this makes more sense, then use this. But don't confuse this N here with the, say, 100 respondents that we have. That's not what we're looking at. So this whole thing actually should end up being a fairly small number just because of the size of your contingency tables. Okay. And so I this part here, this note, is really talking about um, that we are measuring variances up here. I'm just going to clean this up a little bit there. Okay. And... Uh, then what we do is we calculate the test statistic. By the way, the best way to calculate the EIJs is just simply using this. The row I total times the column J total divided by the grand total, the sample size. All right. And then we come up with our decision and conclusion. So given that, let's solve this particular problem here. So solve the baby time of birth problem using the classical approach. We could do this as a p-value approach, but uh, we won't worry about that quite at this point. I might take a look at that just at the end here. The initial table is shown again here with space for the EIJs. So let's take a look at what we've got here. Step number one, HO. We would say gender and time of birth are independent. If you prefer, you could use, you could say not related. Against the alternative, that gender and time of birth are dependent. Or you could say that they are related. Just gonna move my computer out of the way here. There, okay. Step number two is the formula that we're gonna be using is always this guy here. It's the summations of the FIJs minus the EIJs squared over the EIJs. And you do that for each of the six cells. So you figure out that difference divided by EIJ, you square it, and then you sum them all up. Your critical region, your decision rule, looks like this. So here is a chi-square distribution with how many degrees of freedom? Just give that a, a thought for a moment. Okay. And hopefully you stopped the video and gave it some thought there. It's two. So the number of rows minus one would be two minus one times number of columns minus one 2 minus 1 times 3 minus 1 is 2. So remember with chi-square distribution, it means that 2 is in the middle there. And this is a always, always an upper tail test. So we're going to put our alpha here. Uh, we'll assume an alpha of 5% unless we're told otherwise. And so it's always an upper tail test. <clears throat> okay, let's go to a chi-square table. So page 21 here, and it looks like I've got this uh, needs to be cleaned up a little bit from before. There we go. Okay, 
So let's go to two degrees of freedom, and we're going to be going to right all the way up here under the 5% column here. So 5% to the right, that gives you a critical value of 5.99. Okay. So, oops. Uh, that was 68, not 63. Okay. So this is going to be 5.99. If you want to write that as a statement, of course, say on an exam, you could say if the chi-square star value is greater than 5.99, then we will reject HO. All right, step number four. Um, the only problem with step number four is that from this point forward in the course, you you get into a lot more complex calculations here. But let's figure out each of these EIJs first. And so what you do is for this particular cell, what we're going to do is we're going to take the row total times the column total divided by the grand total. So that, that first one there, I'll just call it F11, will be equal to the... Um, the, the row 1 total times the column 1 total divided by the, the grand total. That's your total n. So, oops. so that's going to be uh, equal to your row total is 30 times 20 divided by 60. And that is 600 over 60 is 10. So that is your FIJ, sorry, your EIJ for that first cell. So that's what we would expect to see if the two are independent of each other. Now, this one here would be 7.5, and that will be 30 times, let me just use a, a different color here. So the 7.5 is going to be 30 times 15 divided by 60. And then this one here is going to be 12.5, Right, 30 times 25 divided by 60. And then uh, this is actually a 30-30 split. These are going to be exactly the same. You could run through the numbers to see. And then you just do a quick check, uh, go across each row. Does it add the 30? Yep. And each column, 10 and 10 is 20, 7.5, 7.5 is 15, and 12 and a half, 12 and a half is 25. So those are the EIJs. Okay, now we calculate the chi-square star value is equal to, and you do this for every cell. So the very first cell then is your FIJ was 15 minus your EIJ of 10 squared over your EIJ, which is 10, plus uh, 5 minus 7.5 squared over 7.5. And you do that for all six cells. So if you're okay, I'll just do a dot, dot, dot. Um, and that'll give us then, when the smoke clears, 7.67, right there. 7.67 is right in here. And so what we would say here then is that 7.67 is greater than 5.99, therefore you're going to reject HO. Now, by the way, it is never okay from this point on to just simply say that there is a relationship. What you need to do is to now describe the relationship. And so this is where we go up here and we say, okay, what we said is that there is enough evidence to say that there is a significant difference between these two. Um, how do you describe that difference? So what I like to do is to go up here and find where are the cells where the FIJ is higher than the EIJ. And this is what you tend to find right there. Okay? And then we can summarize that by saying um, there is a greater 
number of males than expected uh, born in the 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. time. And more, more females, or I guess they're just little girls, little boys and little girls, uh, born um, in the 3 p.m. to, I guess, all the way right through to 7 a.m. time than expected. And by then expected, we mean what we would expect to see if they are independent of each other. So that's what we've got there. That's how you would actually do that. Um, I'm just going to take a look at B here. It says solve using a p-value approach. And in the p-value, we would basically do the same step number one, step number two. Step number three, we would say if the p-value Oops, uh, let me just erase that there. I really don't like writing on glass. If the p-value is less than alpha, reject HO. Step number four is the same, and that gives you a chi-square star of 7.67. Let's just quickly go back over here and find out where that is. And we're looking at 7.67, and it falls right in here, right between those two. 7.67. So it's going to be somewhere between 1% and 2.5%. Okay? 1% and 2.5%. So what we've got here then is the p-value is somewhere between that and that. And that, of course, is um, less than 0 0.05, so therefore reject HO. Last thing I want to do here, reject HO. And, and then you would describe the relationship, right, if you were doing the p-value approach. Last thing I want to do here is just show you what would be the chi-square value that would give us this critical value of 5.98. So the critical value, sorry, 5.99. So the critical value of 5.99 is going to be, it's a chi-square dot inverse dot rt dot point zero five two alpha degrees of freedom always a right tail test inverse of course because it is a um, critical value for the p value here it's going to be so this p value associated with this seven point six seven would be a chi square dot dist dot rt and then it's going to be 7.67 and 2. So there's your chi-square star and here's your degrees of freedom. And it's always a dist function and it's always going to be an rt no matter where it falls. Even if it fell on the left hand side we would calculate it going up because it's always an upper tail test. So that takes us to the end of that. Uh, I want you to do this one for homework. We will take that up in class. So that is number two on page I-7. And then I will pick up another video for the latter pages. So we'll stop it right there. Thanks for watching.